absolutely hate politics. <laughs> In fact, there's nothing I, the only thing I hate more than politics is politicians. I work with them all day. But on November 6, 2012, I was elected as the youngest elected official in Stockton, California's history, with 60% of the vote. And let me say, my political career got off to a less than ideal start. You see, I entered into Stockton at a time when we became the largest city in the history of this nation to declare bankruptcy. Um, I ran for city council at a time when we had a record number of homicides, 70, more per capita than Chicago and more per capita than Afghanistan. So I, when people have a little bit of context, they always ask me, especially if I come back to Stanford, and I talk to my friends that are doing startup stuff and cool things with cool companies, they say, Tubbs. And I say, yes. They say, why in the world <laughs> did you want to run for city council? And then when I go back home to Stockton, I'm talking to young people in high schools, or I'm meeting with grandmothers in nursing homes. They say, why, young man, did you come back to Stockton? <laughs> and, and, and I, and I always say this tongue-in-cheek answer, I always say, I'm not sure I necessarily want it to come back. I say, you know what, I felt more of a calling or a compulsion to do so. And that calling and compulsion came through transforming valley experiences or low points in life into mountainous ones. So my journey to city council began in 2010 during the Stanford and Washington program. I was an intern in the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs for the White House. Sounds prestigious. I didn't want to do it. I wanted to do education policy work. I wanted to be a policy wonk. And I spent 12 hours a day instead Googling mayors and city council members. So I knew too much about Mayor Booker and Newark and too much about Mayor Castro. At one point, I knew all 100 mayors of the top 100 cities and could list three or four policy things they were doing. It was crazy. It was obsessive. I spent, um, I spent Columbus Day researching mayors that were affected by the Gulf oil spill and figuring out ways to send them Christmas cards. And I hated it. But I would say from that experience, I gained some insight into local government. I said, you know what? Local government's good for some people, that some people need to get involved and do local government work, that some people can do good in that work. And it was a great experience. And, but it was around that same time, in about October during my internship, I got a call I'll never forget. It was Halloween. I was in front of a computer, Googling mayors and council members, of course. And I got a call from my mother. And my mom, she, she called. She, she, she sounded really sad. She hung up really abruptly. So I did what any good son does. I ran outside, because I didn't get service in the office. Ran outside, took out my, my phone, and called her back. And she told me, she said, Michael. And I said, yes. She said, your cousin had, had just been murdered. And that's my cousin right there. She said, your cousin had just been murdered. And if, as anyone familiar with Stockton, you know that far too often, premature death, homicides, and violence is a common narrative, especially for boys of color. So the, the murder itself didn't surprise me, but just how, how close it was to me. It was my own family. So I remember flying back home and, and crying and seeing my mom crying, my aunt crying, my grandma crying. See, you see everyone crying? I remember being angry. And I remember this being a real valley experience for me, a real low point. I began to question things. I said, why in the world am I researching these mayors and council members when my own family's dying back home? Why in the world am I at Stanford when all this stuff is happening outside this, this privilege? Like, why, why me? What, what's the point? I was so angry, but I was in the midst of that anger then I gained a little bit of clarity as to what I thought my purpose might be. And I said, you know what? I'm going to run for office in Stockton in 2020 or 2024 after I lived a little bit alive, got a couple more awards, and got a, the resume no one could debate with. <laughs> so I came back to senior year fired up and ready to go. I knew in 2020 I would be on the ballot for Stockton City Council, and I was excited. So I did what every Stanford student does. I applied for a prestigious fellowship. I said, you know what, I need one more fellowship, a couple of years in England, study with some of the smartest people in the world, get the credential, be important, and then I'll be ready to go back and, and serve my city. And it didn't work out that way. I was rejected, and I had no contingency plan, had no backups. I just knew it was my destiny. I had found my purpose as a junior. I knew this was the key to getting there. I had to get this fellowship, and I didn't get it. I was rejected. And like most Stanford students, I wasn't used to being rejected. So again, um, <laughs> again, that was another valley experience for me. It, it was a low point, but from here I learned about using rejection as a redirection. That I took that rejection, I threw a pity party for a day or two, and I, I was upset with the world, and oh my gosh, this is derailing my plans. But I learned that oftentimes, 
Purpose is not going to take you on the path of least resistance. I learned oftentimes that purpose is not necessarily linear, that I may have an end goal in mind, but I don't know every single step I'm going to take to get there. And I, and I also learned that re, rejection is a useful time to recalibrate, reprioritize, and reflect. So in the midst of this rejection, I said, okay, Michael, why did you want this fellowship? Because you don't really like school that much, so you did not want to get a doctor of philosophy. So what did you want this fellowship for? And I said, I wanted to fellowship because I want to go back to Stockton and serve my community. I need a doctor of philosophy from Oxford to do that. <laughs> and then... <laughs> um, so, but then being a Snafferson I am, I Googled. And I Googled, what does it take to be an elected official? And I found something maybe you guys didn't know. It only requires 50% plus one in the vote and, and being 18. Um, <laughs> So, so, so it was in that moment, uh, the moment of rejection, following the previous Valley experience, I said, you know what, skip it. I'm going to run for city council anyway. And let me say, I'm so incredibly happy that I did. It's been a rewarding 121 days. I've made several mistakes, made a lot of people mad, made a lot of people happy, made some new enemies, have a whole bunch of new friends. And none of that was possible without these low points, without these Valley experiences, without these times when I was so upset with God and the world and everything seemed to crumble. And, as I prepare to close, Dr. King, my favorite speech from Dr. King is his I have a dream, not his I have a dream, excuse me, it's the speech when he talks about he's been to the mountaintop. It's the last speech he gave. And he, and he talked about how he was at this mountaintop place in his life and he could see so clearly the future of America and the civil rights movement and himself. And, and as I reflected on that while walking up, I realized that that mountaintop experience was only possible through the valleys he came through. He was only able to go to the mountaintop because he was beaten in Selma. He was only able to go to the mountaintop because he was in the Birmingham jail. He was over, uh, only able to get to the mountaintop because he failed in Albany. Um, so I think Dr. King's really instructive. And this very speech, in fact, was written in the midst of another valid experience. Um, as a procrastinator, I waited to the day the speech was due to begin writing. And before I started to write, I got, a, I got another phone call. I'm um, from a friend that said, my good friend, Sara Cazares, who was school board member, the first elected in Stockton to endorse me, had died rather unexpectedly. So again, I was angry. I was disillusioned. I was, I was tired. I said, how in the world am I going to write this speech when one of my closest friends in Stockton had died? But I, took, I cried a little bit, reflected, thought back about other times when it seemed really low. And I said, what lessons can I gain from this? And I think thanks to another valid experience, it helped me create an idea really worth sharing, so thank you. <laughs>